Let me tell you a story. If you didn't know, before I got into my doctoral program, I was in a master's program in biostatistics. I'm not trying to flex how much student debt I have, there's a point here. The culmination of my two-year master's degree was a statistical consulting class. As a consultant, you listen to someone who has a problem with their research data, you help them out, and then you talk to the class about the problem you heard and what you suggested. And finally, the professor will grill you on your recommendation. You idiots! One class really sticks out in my memory. One team got a relatively simple problem where two groups were being compared, and they suggested a two-sample t-test. I'm sure they thought they were going to get off easy during the question phase. Mid-presentation, the professor stops them and asks them a single question. How would you calculate an appropriate sample size for this test? No answer. Disappointed, the professor turned to the rest of us. Well, do any of you have an answer? There were 40 students in that room, and all of us had a year and a half of graduate level statistical training. What do you think happened? Not one of us dared to speak up to even attempt it. Not even the tryhards. But I'm being a little unfair here. The truth is that most of us in that class only had one chance to practice a sample size calculation in all of our coursework. Sample size calculations are a standard procedure that working statisticians are expected to know, but the fact is, the program didn't properly prepare its students to do one. But here's the thing, I said most students because there were a select few who actually knew an approach to the sample size calculation. I would know because I was one of these lucky few. The problem that day was that we couldn't answer it on the spot. If we even had a minute to pull out our laptops, we could do it, but that wasn't the case here. In this video, I'll explain what this approach was, and I'll teach you how to do it. As a heads up, this video has a significant coding element to it, but you won't need to fully understand R to get something out of it. I'll be walking you through all my code along the way. If you're new here, I'm Christian, and this is Very Normal, the channel for making you better at statistics. Thanks for tuning in. Let's get started. It's worth asking ourselves, why do we calculate sample sizes? Wouldn't we want as big of a sample size as possible? We would, but as with most things, collecting data costs time and money. Instead of just setting a vague goal of getting a big number, statisticians can calculate a sample size that gives us some desirable statistical property. Having a plan is almost always better than not, especially when your experiment is going to cost your company millions of dollars. More often than not, that property is power. Power is the probability that we will reject the null hypothesis given that the null is not true. For a more detailed explanation, go watch my power explainer video and help you boy out. In that video, we saw that more sample size increases power. This is because higher sample size shrinks the variance of the sampling distribution, but it still stays centered at the true mean. The end result is that more of the alternative distribution is past the critical value, so it's easier to observe a test statistic that will let us reject the null hypothesis. The probability that this will happen is given by this area here. That's power. The name of the game is to try to pick a sample size that will give you a desired power, like 80%. What makes it hard to do is that there's a complex, non-linear relationship between sample size and power. There are formulas that solve for sample size for a few specific cases, but I'm not a fan of them, and I'm not going to cover them here. What if I told you we didn't have to use any fancy formulas, and that we could calculate sample sizes purely through raw computation? All we need to do is simulate the experiment through code and do it many, many times. That's right, we're going to do sample size calculation through Monte Carlo simulations. This is the framework for doing Monte Carlo simulations for sample size calculations, or any simulation study for that matter. I'll be using a two sample t-test as an example, but this framework is more general in the sense that I could do this for any hypothesis test. The first step is to generate the data. Since I'm working with the two sample t-test, I need to generate data from two groups. Here, I'll simulate the data for each group from a normal distribution for reasons that will become clear soon. Depending on how I choose the parameters for each group, I can control which hypothesis is true. On one hand, I can simulate a situation where the null hypothesis is true and the population means are the same. Or, I can generate the data from a specific alternative hypothesis and make their population means different. In real world settings, we don't know which hypothesis is true, but Monte Carlo simulations give us the power to control the data generation process. The next step is to perform some sort of statistical procedure on the data. After I generate the data, I need to analyze it. 
so I'll conduct my two sample t-test. I'll specify a two-sided test and use a 5% level. After the actual statistics have been performed, I'll need to record and keep track of the results. I'm specifically interested in whether or not the test rejects or fails to reject the null hypothesis. I'll use the 95% confidence interval to check this. It'll be 1 if the null hypothesis was rejected, and 0 otherwise. This was all for a single hypothesis test. Since we're using a Monte Carlo approach, I'll need to repeat this many times. I'll need a lot of simulations because I'm going to use asymptotic theorems. Specifically, I'll need the law of large numbers at some point, so I'm going to go at 10,000 replications. The Monte Carlo framework looks very simple, and that's because it is. But how can it be so powerful if it's so simple? The key to my simulation study is the results that I collect for each simulation. There's a special random variable called an indicator variable, which I'll just call indicator for short. An indicator is a binary random variable, and it takes the value 1 whenever some pre-specified event E happens, and 0 if it doesn't. It gets its name because it indicates that an event happened. In statistics, this event is usually associated with data, so that's why the indicator itself is a random variable. The most famous example is the flipping of a fair coin. I could specify that the event I want to see is if the coin lands heads up. Then the corresponding indicator will be 1 when we get heads, and 0 if we get tails. An indicator is just a more general version of this idea using a different event. Most of us will be familiar with the idea that you can use coin flips to estimate the probability of getting heads. We can calculate the sample proportion of flips that ended up heads. And this proportion will be a good estimate for the true probability of getting heads. The law of large numbers tells us that, with more and more data, the sample proportion will be close to the true probability. We're going to hijack this intuition for our sample size calculation. In our context, the event that I'm interested in is the null hypothesis being rejected. If I run these simulations and take the proportion of all the indicator variables I produce, I'll get an estimate for the probability of rejecting the null hypothesis. But here's the key. This indicator can also be interpreted as a conditional indicator. Remember that the very first step was to generate data, and at that point, I needed to choose which hypothesis I wanted to be true. When I generate data from a world where the null hypothesis is true, then the resulting indicator I record is also conditioned on the null hypothesis. With the law of large numbers, this proportion converges to the true conditional probability. You might recognize this as type 1 error. And as we'll see in the following examples, when the data comes from a specific alternative hypothesis, our sample proportion becomes an estimate for power instead. We're going to go through a series of three examples, each with their own point to make. As a first example, I'll generate data such that there's no difference between the population means of two groups, and I'll generate 30 observations for each group. I'll run all the simulations and collect all of our indicator variables. When I calculate the sample mean, I get a value of 0 0.0466. This proportion tells us that 4.6% of the simulations rejected the null hypothesis, conditioned on the null hypothesis being true. In theory, this should be exactly 5% because the critical values are defined by percentiles. Using simulations, we can get a pretty close estimate. I wanted to show you this because you can always compare your simulation results to what you should be seeing in theory. Here's a second example. I'll make a slight modification and generate the data such that the treatment effect is 0.05 between the two population means. I'm conditioning on a specific alternative hypothesis being true, so the proportion is now an estimate for power. After running the calculation, my estimate for power is about 47% based on how I simulated the data. In this example, I calculated power from a given sample size, but I actually want the other way around. I want you to view this entire piece of code as a function, where the input is the sample size and the output is power. What I'm going to do is iterate over different sample sizes. For each value, I'll calculate power and check if it reaches or passes 80%. Once it does, I can stop the loop and check what sample size was needed to achieve this. I'm not going to pretend this is the most optimized R code you'll ever see, but it does the job and it's easy to read. With the power of editing, I can show you the results immediately. The loop stops at a sample size of 64 people per group to achieve 80% power. But wait! There's more! So I'll take one last step and double check this result. 
there are libraries out there that have functions that contain common sample size calculations. One such R library is the power library. To calculate sample size with this function, I need to plug in the characteristics of our simulation study. I use the 5% level for a two-sided test, and I know I want 80% power. What I've left out is the argument for sample size, and the function is written to calculate this for me if I leave it out. What I get is 63.7. Since I can't cut people up into parts, I'll round it up to a clean 64. And this is exactly what we got from the Monte Carlo approach. You might be asking, what's the point of doing a simulation if there are functions that can do the same thing? In my opinion, it never hurts to have more options to do the same thing. If you relied entirely on the power library, then you're boned if you want to do a sample size calculation for a hypothesis test that isn't in the library. The Monte Carlo approach is more general, and you could apply it to different hypothesis tests or different ways to generate data. No matter what you choose, the framework is basically the same. For example, if you wanted to use the Mann-Whitney test, which is like a non-parametric analog to the two-sample t-test, all you need to do is place that in the code instead. Even more powerful, you could also generate data that violates the assumptions of your hypothesis test. Instead of using the normal distribution to generate the data, you could use a Cauchy distribution instead. Then, you can run the simulation study again and actually see and quantify how much this violation influences your type 1 error and power. And this is much more powerful than being cynical and crying, statistics is all lies in the comments section. In this video, I taught you the Monte Carlo approach for sample size calculations. It takes a bit more time than mindlessly solving an equation, but it offers a general framework for not just doing the calculation, but also playing with statistical ideas. More students would benefit from knowing how to do simulation studies, especially early in their learning. So I'll do my part in teaching whoever wants to listen. I'm doing my part. I'm doing my part. You can find a link to all the code I wrote for this video in the description below. If you like learning about statistics, then consider subscribing to the channel and maybe even my newsletter. The newsletter is the best way to stay updated with all the new stuff I'm making. Thanks for watching. I'll see you all in the next one.